We are at a very extraordinary stage in the evolution of human beings. And there was a certain point in time, a little while ago, where something really different, something extraordinary started to happen. And that was a transformation of humankind itself. And what you're talking about here, the Avatar projects and 2045, are a, a, a stage well, well beyond that. Again, an extraordinary transformation of human beings. But I think it's desirable to take the exciting material that you're going to hear for the next few days and set it into the overall context of humanity, the, the overall context of the transformation that is um, happening. And uh, let's see if I can find a computer here. <laughs> So, um, it, it really all started about the middle of the 18th century. And at that time, there was, the, there was really no technology. There had been, been a lot of science, Isaac Newton and Galileo and so on. But one of the amazing things at that time is there was no machine, no complex machine on the planet except for church clocks and, and Swiss watches. And a group of uh, men, about really about five of them, got together and they rode to each other's homes on moonlit nights because there were lots of robbers. And they talked about the future, talked about ideas about the future, rather like what is going on here. And uh, they uh, decided there are things which really ought to be different in the future. And they talked about poetry, they talked about art. There was one very nervous person who thought he could harness steam, and that was James Watt who eventually perfected the steam engine. And this uh, group of five, they weren't academics, they weren't wealthy, they were not part of the aristocracy, they were sort of the outsiders, if you will, of society. And very often, th that's the way great changes happen. And anyway, this is, this is the, the beginning of the story. And to uh, skip a, a long way into it, um, I, I like to use this curve which shows the percentage of the transformation. So the transformation was pretty small in the beginning. And as we climb up the curve, we get to a point in the, in the curve where it's extremely steep, and that's the present time. And that's really saying that changes are happening very fast indeed. Now, as you execute the extraordinary changes which this two days are going to talk about, you've really got to fit those into the rest of what is happening on the planet. So in this first session, I want to talk about the transformation of humankind, not talking about brain science, because that's going to be done very well later on, not talking about immortality or anything like that, because that's going to be done uh, very well later on, but to ask a lot of questions about how does the evolution of this extraordinary new set of ideas fit in to the rest of the evolution. It really need, needs to be integrated with it, an integrated part of the evolution of, of humankind. So, uh, first we had the Industrial Revolution, then we moved into a time where there was uh, extreme exponential growth, we're still in that era now, massive, massively fast exponential growth of computing and uh, many other technologies. A lot of people just talk about computing, but they don't realize how important biological technologies, stem cell technologies, quantum uh, development are in that very fast evolution. And this leads us into an era of uh, extreme paradigm shifts. And uh, we're going to see a lot of pretty big, pretty dangerous, pretty extraordinary paradigm shifts happening in the, uh, in, the, in the near future. So I'd like to describe what some of those are and then uh, try and give you an idea how they fit in to the uh, story that is the rest of the two days. But this century, uh, the 21st century, is a make or break century. There are some very dangerous things happening. And if we don't get them right, if we don't control climate change before it becomes uh, beyond a runaway tipping point. If we don't do that, then it's going to be uh, very dangerous. Many other things which are dangerous. This is uh, uh, 2045, and uh, so 2045 uh, is an era, I'll call it the, the post-brain map era. We're starting now to map the human brain, which is an incredibly difficult project. And people will talk about it here. And so the assumption that uh, we might use here is that it will be finished by uh, 2045, and we'll be able to replicate many of the things in the human brain in uh, electronics or in quantum systems. And uh, there's a big question mark about if we can map the human brain completely, then could we take your brain and map it into computers or map it into electronics? And if we could do that, what would be the consequences of, of that happening? Very, very big questions. Uh, we certainly don't know the answer. We don't know whether we'll succeed in mapping the human brain. It's going to be much more different 
much more difficult than mapping the human genome because the brain has the capability to constantly change. Your genome sits still and doesn't change. Your brain is rewiring itself constantly, very fast, all, all of the time. It's quite a, a remarkable uh, instrument. Now, I'm particularly interested in this because at my ripe old age, I've just had grandchildren for the first time. And that was a wonderful experience for a man of my age, boy and a girl and twin. So I naturally asked myself, uh, what on earth is their life going to be like for the next 10 years, the next 20 uh, years? What, what will they be doing by 2040? By the time they are uh, uh, 30 or so, will it be possible to map their brain? Can their brain be moved into computers? So uh, thinking of it in, in really human terms about what it's going to do to people is very important. Their life expectancy will be much higher than it is today. Uh, I think my life expectancy is maybe 20 years higher than my uh, grandfather's life expectancy, and it's continuing to increase. Some people say that people born today will have a life expectancy of 120. Some people say that 300, a wide range of different uh, numbers there. Uh, but if you uh, live to be 300, you know, what will your sex life be like for the last 200 years of it? And uh, the, 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 a lot of questions like that which relate not just to lifespan. We want this long life to be healthy. We want it to be uh, an uh, intellect span. So how will the intellect affect new people? A culture span. So we want to build a world in which there's a lot of attention to culture, culture much better than the cultures we have today. There's one group of people who study that, and uh, one of the conclusions they seem to be coming to is that the countries with the highest growth in GDP tend to have a low growth in culture. So this is a pretty interesting reflection on how we're going to try and change that. What's that going to do to the future? Quality of life, extremely important indeed. And it's quite clear that if we do the, the right things, uh, if you do the right things in your lifetime, it will lead to uh, a neo-renaissance, a, a new type of renaissance. Very different from the uh, renaissance of Fl Florence. But we're talking about a, a journey here which is very different from just the, the journey of brain mapping and trying to get the uh, brain and into electronics and so on. This is very much concerned with spiritual issues, it's very much concerned with cultural issues, it's very much concerned with how do we build a great new civilization where the maximum happiness exists among the people in that civilization. So this is a, a very important part of it. And now in their lifetime they could see the birth, probably almost certainly will see the birth of a global renaissance, but they could also see a, a collapse into extreme chaos, or both. And I think it's certain that both of those things are going to happen mixed up in the planet. There are lots of things which I want to describe which are out of control. We're not taking the right actions about them. There will be chaos as well as magnificence uh, at the same time in the world that we're describing. So ex explosive changes and these explosive changes leading to the time of uh, 2045 which I'll refer to as the post-brain map era. The Earth has a very thin and complex surface with the farms and mountains on it. And uh, if we uh, created a, a model of the Earth which was uh, uh, a thousand feet across, the uh, surface which we live on would be the thickness of an, an eggshell. So very, very tiny on, on a model which is uh, looking at that. And uh, now, w w what is new word is coming to our vocabulary. We used to talk about the Holocene. We talked about geological ages. There'd be many different names for geological ages. But now we call it the Anthropocene. Anthropo meaning human. We are saying in that statement that a geological age, the most important thing in a geological age is the behavior of humans because they are changing the oceans, they're changing the atmosphere, they're changing the uh, animal, animals of the planet, and so on. So the Anthropocene, very important word. And what we find now is the popu human population is growing to 9 or 10 billion. There's total human disregard for biodiversity, total human disregard for many of the things which are very important in the uh, Anthropocene, accelerating destruction of the environment, a human footprint far beyond that which is sustainable, the possibility of moving to a, 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 a tipping point in the climate where the climate becomes completely out of control. So I look at my two twins and say, by the time they're 30, is the climate going to be totally out of control? 
what is the probability of it being totally out of control? Well, today you might say 90%. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty bad. And so these are, these are things that we've got to deal with. So the Anthropocene is self-destructive, which is a horrifying statement. And it's today's generation of young people that must stop that being true, take appropriate actions to make sure that the Anthropocene is not self-destructive. We uh, have 7,300 nuclear weapons. And uh, so with, with the nuclear weapons that we have today, we could vaporize every city on the planet. Why on earth do we have such a huge amount? It used to be 70,000, so the good news is we are reducing the number of nuclear weapons. The bad news is that the probability of using them is becoming much greater because we're moving into a, an era now of autonomous drones we're using uh, an era in which the top military people are planning a, a blitzkrieg which involves massive cyber war and so there are many things like that. If, if nuclear weapons are used, they almost certainly won't be used by a government, not unless it's North Korea. They'll probably be used by terrorists or by a, a mafia organization. And so that, as you look up the probabilities, that makes, uh, and people are usually surprised to hear this, the probability of nuclear use is worse now, is higher now than it has been since 1962. And uh, uh, it's quite probable that there will be some sort of nuclear use before we get to 2045. Now, an interesting thing is we now know that there are no planets very near to this one. There's no planet in the solar system that has interesting life. We may possibly find microbes on Mars or something like that, but certainly nothing intelligent in the solar system. And the nearest planet is we've been discovering the exoplanets far away. And uh, the, the nearest planets are 20 trillion, not billion, 20 trillion miles away. So what that is saying is there's no intelligent life other than us within 20 trillion miles. What that is saying is we are absolutely alone, starkly alone. So if we did destroy the human life on this planet, then there wouldn't be anything that would replace it. Evolution, of course, would go on, but after 100 million years of new evolution, it wouldn't produce anything like us. Produce something quite different, might produce... Uh, uh, an earth which, uh, where the chief animal was uh, singing warthogs or something like that. Certainly, certainly nothing like ourselves. And we are absolutely alone. And so we need to talk, teach that to young people today. One of the things we need to teach them is that Star Trek is absolute nonsense. And one thing I get in trouble with when I'm lecturing is that statement. Uh, uh, everybody attacks me when I say Star Trek is nonsense. And again, very well dressed lawyers coming up saying, I have it on exceedingly good authority that everything in Star Trek could happen in reality. And I say, are you a lawyer? You're certainly not a scientist. And uh, so uh, Star Trek, enormous fun. I enjoy it, enjoy it incredibly. But, but we need to get real about what's likely to happen. Now, uh, humanity's footprint, that is the, f the footprint, the proportion of human resources that we're using is uh, growing rapidly. Uh, it went beyond 100%, it's fairly close to 200% now. That means that if we keep, keep up with that use of resources, we would need two Earths, not one, to satisfy them. So this just can't go on. That means a crunch is coming. Every year, humankind uh, loses um, to 24 million billion tons of topsoil, creates 50 million uh, acres of new desert and so on. Many, many statements like this, which are all statements about how we are using up uh, the Earth's resources in a way which is totally non-sustainable. And that can't go on forever, so we would say a crunch is coming. In the next eight years, the number of cars on the planet will double. In the next eight years, the number of cars in America will go down slightly, but the reason it will double is because you've got enormous countries like China and India uh, where the people will want to have cars. Atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide levels are higher than they have been in 800,000 years, and they will go very much higher, and this is causing uh, global warming and will lead to extreme climate change. The terrible tornado that you saw in the, the town of Moore uh, in Oklahoma, that's going to happen over and over again because we, we, we've wrecked the climate, we're moving into worse and worse climate change. So uh, extreme weather, extreme hurricanes, and uh, this, this is the, the world we built for ourselves. Now the world population is growing very rapidly, as you know, 
And uh, the good news is that uh, women are having less children, fertility rates are coming down, and where they are coming down is where we have educated the women. And uh, we found that when we taught women to read, they had fewer babies. Then we found when we uh, allowed women to get good jobs, they had fewer babies. When we had societies where women could have uh, the same jobs as men, they often didn't have babies at all, didn't get married until they were 35 or so. So um, as, we, as we look at population, it will continue to grow upwards to about 9 billion, maybe 10 billion. But after that, it will start to decline. But the decline will be very slow, like throwing a tennis ball in the air. And so we need to focus on that. Now, China had a, a one-child policy and enforced it brutally. And uh, now, at the start of its one-child policy, that was 1979, the population was uh, 975 million. But now the population of China is 1.35 billion. So if you had a one-child policy, what on earth could be the reason for that? Well, what is the reason for that is when they started the one-child policy, uh, uh, life expectancy was about 30 to 35. Now life, life expectancy in China is around about 70. If you increase life expectancy, then you're going to increase the population size. So this is why the population will probably go up to 10 billion. Now what you're talking about, or what you will be talking about in some of the sessions that are going on uh, after this, is to enormously increase life expectancy. And that is great. I would like to live to as old an age as possible if I can do things which are very interesting and intelligent and many other people are like that. Technology will help to make that happen, but it will increase the population. And so a big question uh, becomes, uh, can, can we feed uh, that number of, of people? In uh, 2045, the computer models say there will be 8.7 billion people on the planet. Can we feed them? The amount of fossil hydrocarbon that is coming into the atmosphere took millions of years to form. Uh, the, the amount every, every year took millions of years to form. By uh, 2045, unless we take coordinated action, the climate will be irreversibly damaged. That means we will have passed a tipping point in which it continues to get worse no matter what we do to uh, try and correct it. And this is very well understood. It's understood in the computer models. There are no end of uh, computer scientists who work on this. There are lots of solutions to it. We know what the solutions are. The single biggest problem is coal. So if we could control uh, coal, the filth from coal getting into the atmosphere, that would have an enormous effect on, on changing the climate. But in fact, we're burning more and more coal every year and the coal industry is doing everything it possibly can to keep on selling the coal that it has. Um, there's a, a good chance that before 2045, unless we take coordinated action, we will see nuclear weapons being used. And uh, can we feed the, all these people? Unless we take coordinated action, there'll be famine on the grandest scale. So giga famine coinciding with the, uh, the D level of the Avatar project. And, uh, and then the, the beginning of the, pro uh, the, the, the brain, post brain map here. Once we have mapped the human brain and do have the capability to get it into computers, that's going to change humanity enormously. And we, we don't know how, but it will be very powerful. It will probably be the strongest force changing humanity. Now, much of the uh, Earth has got no water, it's got no soil. It looks like this. Large amount of the planet looks like this. In fact, large amount of the planet which had good soil 50 years ago looks like this. We've, we've destroyed the soil in many parts of the planet. And uh, so there's no way uh, that we can economically grow food in that unless we totally automate the production of food growing. This is India, and uh, this is a, a real uh, picture of a massive uh, hydroponics food factory and that takes very little water. The price of food uh, coming from this factory is about the same as the price from conventional farming. So one of the things I'm saying is as we look at technology we've got terrible problems ahead of us but the important thing to say is there are solutions to all of those problems. That's what the Martin School is concerned with, looking at the biggest problems on the planet and the biggest opportunities and saying how do we get there? What are the solutions? How can we make that work? And so, so many, many different solutions in, in what is happening. Here, here are the roots. The roots don't grow in soil in hydroponics. They grow either in water or in a plastic like that. And the goal of hydroponics is to feel, feed absolutely the optimum nutrients 
to the, the plants, and then they grow very well and they taste very good indeed. So totally different approach to uh, food growing. Amazingly, only 10% of China's land is arable land. So they're going to be extremely dependent upon automated uh, farming. Every year mankind uh, uses 160 billion tons more water than is being replaced. And uh, that would be 25 million water trucks of this size. That's how much water we're using every year and not replacing it. And obviously that can't go on, so with water there is a crunch coming. This is Pakistan. Pakistan is totally dependent on the in Indus River for food growing, so it's made no end of canals from the Indus River into the farms to get the farms to work. And, and that's doing pretty well today because the uh, glaciers are melting in the Himalayas. But if we look at this 20 years in the future, what we'll find long before 2045 is the glaciers will have no ice, large rivers will be dry, most aquifers will be empty. So there's a huge crunch coming relating to water. And again, once you make these statements and the reasons why they're happening, then you can say, okay, how do we stop that? And this is the important question. What are the solutions? There are solutions to all of these things. Some solutions are almost common sense and easy. Others are extremely difficult to put into place. But we've got to be searching for solutions as strongly as, as we can in the world that we're building. And uh, the rest of the world will want to catch up with America and uh, they are already have uh, cell phones. And so the, uh, some of the poorest people on the planet now have intelligent phones. It's amazing how fast the sales have been. And uh, very quickly they discovered texting and they discovered they could do texting with anybody on the planet. And so uh, simple texting, you can have a software which will do language translation. So you've got kids in the villages in Africa texting with kids in China and, and all the rest of the planet. So the whole of the planet is becoming you know, wired together for young people. So map that 30 years into the future and you're going to have a, a very different humanity. H humanity across the whole planet who understands each other and communicates well with uh, one another. Uh, so a crunch is coming and, and uh, getting them together. Echo affluence, a word I, I like, uh, you can get affluence, you can have a very affluent life cycle without doing things which damage the ecology. And so this means we should be concentrating now on new types of consumer products, great, wonderful, wonderful consumer products to use which don't damage the ecology. So echo affluence, very, very important word. And uh, one, one could almost demonstrate this, there's a picture of a, a town in India where I've added these uh, uh, lights there and uh, the uh, magnificent lights making the uh, place look exciting, rather like Times Square maybe, uh, uh, powered by wind generators. And what the public realizes is, is, is that if the wind starts to stop blowing, then the lights fade. And so this is a demonstration to the public that uh, uh, getting things that are sustainable is absolutely essential. So we need everything to be eco-affluent to growth in the future. James Hansen was the head of NASA and he did lots of calculations, many different types of calculations, and talked to many other uh, authorities who agreed with him that we can't let the uh, number of parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere get, be, be higher than 350. We're now substantially higher than 350. So he says we've got to get it back to 350. If it's, if it's not 350, if it's more than 350, then you're going to move to a time where, where you get runaway global warming. The stunning thing is, although the activists have been working very hard to uh, get the uh, number 350, you know, in, in, in realistic terms, it's impossible. We've got to a point now where we can never, this century, reach Hansen's number. By 2045, a lot of people will be living like this, very badly damaged uh, climate. Of course, we're very, very different in different parts of the Earth, but we'll uh, build huge biodomes uh, in which uh, humans will be protected from the, uh, the, the climate damage. So a very different world from what we visualize today. So again, in this area, a crunch is coming and massive solutions can be invented to all of these things. Greenland, for example, is very solid when you get to the top of it. I've been to the top of Greenland. This is the top of Greenland. And you could uh, put localized uh, climate engineering there so that we are lessening the sunlight, which is the top of Greenland. And Greenland is melting at a frightening rate today. And so to do that at the top of Greenland would be one of many things one could do that would uh, lessen 
the move towards uh, climate destruction. We need radically new energy sources. The energy sources we have at the present time generate too much carbon. Coal is just a, an absolute uh, catastrophe. We've got two fusion projects costing a fortune. The one in Los Alamos uh, has cost something like $20 billion. The one in Europe, ITER, has uh, cost over $15 billion. And there's not a dog's chance that either of them will be generating electricity in time to, to deal with the climate problem that's ahead of us. Meanwhile, there are other inventors who invented very tiny fusion devices, like this. This, uh, this, this is a, a fusion device that's about eight feet across. You can get it into a sm small room. Uh, it's a tokamak, uh, like the one at Heater. And so this is a, a very exciting new technology. Uh, and everywhere you look, you can find exciting new technologies. And we need to get people to understand those technologies which will solve the biggest problems. And for all the biggest problems, there are lots of new, exciting technologies. So lots, lots of different technologies there. The second biggest cause of global warming um, after coal is not uh, cars or petroleum, it's cows. Uh, cows uh, belching and, and all the other things that cows do. Now we could uh, capture the, uh, the stuff that they belch, the, the methane from cows, and, um, but, but if we did that, we need something this size. With, with every cow, which we'd have to empty in a clean way uh, every day, and there are 1.5 billion cows, so that doesn't look like a very practical solution. Nevertheless, the, the weight of cows on Earth exceeds the weight of humans, and they occupy a land area twice the size of the United States, and uh, to reduce the planet's cows from 1.5 billion to um, uh, 200,000 would be extremely difficult uh, indeed. But that's one of the, the, the giant solutions. We've got, we've got things like this which are not, not in public radar at all, but, but are very big parts of, of solving the problem. <laughs> and uh, now by the time we get to 2021, we've got very elaborate models, computer models, of the climate and the weather and global warming and so on. And uh, this is a, a model of 2021, and there'll be a belt. Uh, we can see the slightly shaded part here. If we push that forward to 2045, the belt will be much stronger. And that means that there will be not, not enough sunlight for many of the farms. The farms in that darker belt, there, uh, some of them are already starting to close. So one of the problems of the future is as you get a uh, high level of uh, global warming, you're going to get many of the farms closing. And it'll get worse than that. <coughs> three degrees, it'll probably be three degrees unless we take very drastic action. By 2050, this is what the IPCC models are showing today, and uh, get up to four degrees by uh, 2072. If it gets up to four degrees, then we are in a situation where we're far beyond the tipping point in climate destruction where we can easily uh, reverse it. And the public don't know that. Jim Hansen's been saying it and advocating it and going into great detail about it, but we need uh, the whole public to understand that we've got to do everything possible to stop getting to that tipping point where the problem becomes irre irreversible. So a lot of crunches. Climate destruction, water, non-sustainable footprint, uh, poor, poor nations wanting rich lifestyles, farms closing, famine, and uh, now what happens when you get these crunches is <coughs> one word which is politically uh, n not, u not usable, you know. Let me say something which is totally politically incorrect. The world will not be equal. The world will not be rich countries giving lots of money to poor countries. As we get into the crunches we're talking about, the world as it has been for the last three and a half billion years will be Darwinian. It will be survival of the fittest. So the problems we're describing are problems of survival of the fittest. And, and so uh, uh, a conversation that you don't get among politically correct people, you do get among uh, high business dinners, and I've ha ha had been involved in this conversation in many different places, different parts of the world, highly intelligent men say, a crunch is coming, it's inevitable that uh, a, a crunch is coming, a survival of the fittest, who will the survivors be? And the number one answer is China. China understands these things. It's got a government that's brilliantly intelligent, knows the facts. A government that is totalitarian, 
they wouldn't normally like to use the word communism, but they're strongly totalitarian. But the interesting thing to say about the ministers of China is that they are brilliantly intelligent, they know what is going to happen, and they are planning for it. Whereas America is not planning for it. Europe is not planning for it. Nevertheless, yours, America is the strongest country by far, so certainly America is going to be a survivor in all of this, though the survival might be something of a mess. India, India is going to be, uh, by 20 years from now, India will have a population larger than China. So if you had the same GDP per capita, India would have uh, uh, an economy. It probably will have an economy by 50 years from now, which is larger than the economy of, of China, both of them being larger than the economy of the United States. So by, by uh, 2045, biggest economy, China, second biggest economy, India, third biggest economy, United States. This, this is the way it's shaping up. Russia. Why is Russia on there? Well, Russia is huge. It uh, spans 11 and a half time zones, by far the biggest country on the planet. Absolutely enormous. Its population is only 140 million. That's around about the same population as uh, Japan, and yet it's 45 times the, the size of Japan. The largest freshwater lake in the world is uh, in, in Russia. 20% of all of the freshwater on the planet uh, uh, are in that uh, lake. So Russia's going to be okay. Um, so who, who are the survivors going to be? Now if it's politically incorrect to talk about things being Darwinian and survivors, now let me say something which is far more politically incorrect. And that is most of the survivors will be corporations giant corporations, corporations which are combining and getting together global multinational corporations. People are usually surprised when I tell them that uh, Walmart is twice the size of Israel. And uh, so many of those corporations. And they're now beginning to connect together. So connection in real time between the huge computer nervous systems of these different corporations, massively computerized mergers and acquisitions. And uh, if the public don't know about the dangers that we're talking about, the boards of directors of these corporations certainly do. And they're talking about their future and how they can manage their future. But nevertheless, you've got a, a lack of ethics. You have uh, the coal industry, for example, which is the biggest villain. Coal industry doing far more damage than uh, anything else. But rather than trying to behave correctly, it's flooding the public with incredibly expensive PR which tells the public exactly the opposite thing. Big money PR. There's an American coalition for clean energy from 15 corporations. These corporations have combined revenues of $146 billion. So you've got about a billion dollars going into PR to kid the American public. And the main thing they want the American public to understand is that coal is clean. And you couldn't have a much more uh, incorrect message than that. People sometimes ask me, well, would I want to bring up my family next to a nuclear power station? And I say, yeah, sure, if it's a, a modern light water reactor, uh, well designed, uh, no problem at all. I'd be quite happy to live next to a nuclear power station. But I would in no sense, under the sun, allow any of my family to grow up near a coal power station. These coal power stations are killing enormous numbers of people every year. And so the facts are so different from the PR which you are being fed all the time. And uh, coal, coal, coal ha produces particles which are less than 2.5 microns. Um, particles which are that very tiny size settle into your lungs. And you've got lots of little pores in the lungs which absorb those uh, mo molecules, less than 2.5 microns. And so you've got uh, lots of people. Uh, premature deaths in the United States alone from coal is 24,000 people a year. Just think of the number of 9-11s per year that are coming from the coal industry. And anyway, we've got, we've got giant problems. The giant problems are the public are ignorant of these issues. Because they're ignorant, politicians are ignorant of the issues. P politicians want to do what the public wants. And uh, global corporations understand the big issues, but wrong behavior is very profitable. So you're getting lots of very profitable behavior from some big corporations. And uh, many major corporations are adverse to solutions. Just look at this picture. They're logging the Congo. They're cutting down trees 500 years old. No end of these trees being cut down to, to manufacture cheap furniture. And uh, that sort of thing is going on all over the place with the public not knowing about it.
So anyway, we need uh, to understand the problem. We, we then need uh, critical multidisciplinary research. What we find is if you try and find solutions to the big problems we're talking about here, you can't do it with one discipline. All, all of these big problems need many disciplines uh, integrated together. So multidisciplinary academia is vital. And you can look across all the universities of the world. There's almost none that are doing uh, multidisciplinary research to deal with uh, practical problems. And it's quite difficult to do. It took quite a long time to... Not the Martin School in Oxford before we found a methodology. I've always been concerned with methodologies for doing complex things. And so we have a methodology now for multidisciplinary research. And the key to the methodology is to making, making the, 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 the PhDs of different disciplines talk the same language. So you've got to put a common language into place and relate that language to the research and to the solutions. And what we find is that the PhDs who didn't want to touch multidisciplinary research before absolutely love it. In fact, you see when they all get together at the Martin School, they have big uh, uh, tea parties, cocktail parties and things like that. And it's a wonderful, wonderfully happy event. A lot of people who are very happy in what they're doing because they, uh, they know they've got a secure job, they know it's dealing with the most important problems on the planet and the research itself is exciting and by and large it's getting fast results. So we need more of that. Research results aimed at global action and corporate regulations, uh, full natural, natural capital accounting and a fully informed, informed public. The public is not informed about anything today. So it might make sense to say, let's take a city which has got big neon light displays like Times Square or the Ginza in Japan and put signs there. So imagine this uh, being the Ginza in 2045, you've got a sign there saying what the world population is, <laughs> 8.7 by that time. Carbon, uh, 530 parts per million. Local footprint in that area, 234% of what is uh, sustainable. And so, getting information to the public is critical. Now, as we get uh, um, global warming, some cities will be harmed by it. Uh, many cities will be harmed by it. In fact, much of the world we know today will be harmed by it. But there are other parts of the world, a large number of other parts of the world, that will benefit from global warming. I think the most beautiful place on the planet is Patagonia. It's huge, almost nobody living in there. One of the most beautiful places on Earth. And as we get warming, it's, very, it's down in the south of South America, so uh, somewhat cold. As we get global warming, uh, uh, Patagonia will benefit. It's already beginning to benefit from global warming. Vermont, here, I've got a home in Vermont. Vermont is um, beginning to benefit from uh, global warming. And so it really doesn't make sense to spend huge amounts of money to build new cities like Dubai or some of the new cities in, in uh, locations in China. It makes sense to say, let's build new cities w w in places that are going to benefit from, from climate control. And people are beginning to do this now. There are some billionaires that are buying up enormous stretches of land in, in Patagonia, for example. And I refer to these as climate change cities. And there'll be lots of climate change cities. The real estate in climate change cities will be the fastest rising price real estate on the, on the planet. As, as Dubai was for about seven years. Shanghai was for about seven years. So huge amount of money going into uh, climate change cities and the dots here show the uh, locations of them. Of, often uh, completely new, desi new design, beautiful design, cultured cities, ultra-secure ultra cities designed from the beginning for the security problems that we know will exist in 20 years' time. Fully automated and uh, high level of intellect, in intensive employment. Now, one technology that uh, works very well is to have a car which you don't have to drive, a car which is autonomous. And the first big example of that was from Google, and they had a car which looked like a quite ordinary car, and it was driven for um, 300,000 miles without a human touching the controls at all. And uh, so now every, every car manufacturer has got a, a major development effort in and to, to create autonomous cars, cars where the driver doesn't touch the controls. Three states in America have made it illegal to have cars on the streets where nobody is driving them. The first state to pass that law was Texas, and the interesting thing is that Texas has the highest proportion of deaths from drunken driving of, of any state. 
and if you have cars which can't crash, which don't crash, then you're going to stop the deaths from drunken driving. What, what do you think the worst killer on the planet is? It, is it war? Is it, is it malaria? Is it AIDS? No, there's one killer that's much larger than those, and that is people killed by driving. And it's well over a million people every year that are, that are killed by driving. And so as, as these cars slowly get accepted, I think they're, they're, the technology is going to work very fast, but the public acceptance is going to be pretty slow of cars like this. But it, as it is accepted, you're going to have big advertisements saying, human drivers kill. Get them off the road. And so this is one of the, the big uh, interesting changes that's coming. Now, uh, as soon as you say that that's going to happen, then you can design climate change cities for cars which are autonomous. So most cars which are autonomous, done by the big car companies, look like today's cars. Some are completely different. This obviously looks completely different from cars we have today. It has two, two passengers. And uh, no, that's from General Motors in, in Europe. And General Motors have signed a contract with China so that one city trying to building so many new cities. So one new city of more, more than a million people has signed a contract saying that all of its cars will be this car. So they're, they're building one city to test the concepts of autonomous uh, cars without drivers touching the controls. So there are many things in the technology which change, uh, uh, change society and we need to know about those and understand them. Um, now, the population is tending to move to cities. As they move to cities, that means you've got uh, freedom uh, in the, the non-city areas. So, um, they can have lots of glass. All, all, all this glass is, 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 generates electricity. And so, the, the solar cells we've got today are pretty expensive and pretty crude. Uh, crystalline solar cells. And you can make organic solar cells. With organic solar cells, you could roll out a carpet where the whole carpet is generating electricity. Or you could have buildings where all of the windows are generating electricity. And that, that's the case in this example. And this comes from the Oxford Martin School. And one of the things that the people who did this tell me is that they can get the cost of solar-powered electricity down to one-fifth of the cost that it has today. And when it comes down to that cost, it will be much cheaper than wind generators, it will be much cheaper than most other things. Basically, the real solution for getting rid of coal is to get alternate forms of energy which are cheaper than coal. And uh, coal is much more expensive than you know when you pay for it because nobody counts the cost of the medical problems and all the other problems that come from the coal industry. Huge uh, trains, very fast trains, going to the climate change cities, fast trains in China, uh, all, all humans have a, a normal distribution of IQ, and so this is a rich climate change city in the future, and this is a, a slum area in the future. That bottom photograph is a, a real photograph, uh, and that's got uh, more than a million people uh, living in it. And there's one toilet for 1,700 people in, in that area, and you've got huge slum areas like this today. We talk about uh, shanty towns, I think we should be using the word shanty cities because you have lots of places of a size of a million people where you've got that horror. And so as, as we move forward into the future, we need to be using our technology, using our cell phones and everything else to greatly improve the life of people who are living in places like that today. But you tend to have two economies side by side. You have the rich and the poor side by side. This diagram is fascinating. It's in South Africa. Uh, the, this is the, the, the people living in absolute squalor there, uh, in, in, in the words of South Africa, they're one cricket ball throw from the thing that's in the center. Now the thing is in the center, that person has got his head in a vice and he's got a, a very powerful electronic device uh, scanning his head, concerned with changing the brain. And in particular, the, an electronic device like that with a subatomic particle beam can detect any cell in the brain which is cancerous. And then with a different type of subatomic particle beam, you can kill the cancerous cells. So this is wonderfully advanced technology. There are all sorts of examples of wonderfully advanced technology like that. But it's totally ignoring the surrounding area of people that are in absolute poverty. This is what much of the world is like today. Now, technology, as I'm sure everybody's going to say, carbon nanotubes, graphene, epitaxial graphene is going to replace uh, silicon. So one of the technologies that will make a fortune in the near future is uh, epitaxial graphene. 
and that will lead to small machines with enormous amounts of power. I've just bought a, a music library which I want to carry around the world, and this music library is about half the size of a, a credit card. And if you use it with the, the Bose earphones, which will eliminate uh, noise, the sounds are absolutely wonderful. So many things like that coming from the new technologies. And you've got supercomputers. Computing seems to go through uh, accelerating curves like this, one technology replacing another technology. In 2020, we talked about terascale computing. And we talked about the teragrid connecting universities together. Terra meaning a trillion. And by 40 years after that, we're going to go up to a, a trillion trillion. So going through these numbers until 2045, we'll use the term yotta frops. Yotta meaning a trillion trillion. The, the uh, Latin suffix meaning a trillion trillion. So, so you'll have yotta flops computers, you will have yotta grid networks, yotta byte storage units, colossal clouds of computing capability, yotta scale clouds, uh, yotta scale uh, libraries uh, everywhere. And uh, so Computers, what this is saying is computers are going to keep on accelerating very fast indeed until they become extremely powerful. And all professions will use yotta scale computing by 2045. It will be incredibly important in managing the ecology, managing the environment. We'll have the whole ecology instrumented so that all, all of the information from the instruments comes into huge databases which are uh, uh, handled by these computers. I think a delusion of our time is that uh, artificial intelligence will be like human intelligence. Some of it will, but as we move into the future, probably 99% of artificial intelligence will be utterly different, totally different from human intelligence, one word which has suddenly become uh, fashionable with the National Security Agency and its big data is to talk about data mining. Data mining is a very crude old term that's 20 years old, but what they're saying, if they're collecting this enormous amount of information illegally about you and putting it in utterly gigantic computers, then they've got to have some way of scanning and processing all of that information to find out if any of you are, are bad guys. And that is going on. One of the um, statistics, I haven't seen this in the press, but are interesting statistics. The, the amount of money the National Security Agency is spending on capturing private information about every individual, putting it into huge storage units and then doing data mining on it. The amount of money they're spending on that is $35 billion per year. So uh, <laughs> the whole meaning of the word privacy is uh, changing rapidly and this is part of the inevitable, I think, future that we're talking about. So artificial intelligence will be everywhere, much of it will use quantum computing. We can ask the question, how on earth will ordinary people manage when there is such an extreme rate of change in computing? There's an avalanche of new technology. The time's getting on, so I won't uh, address the individual words on this uh, diagram. But the point I want to make is that many different technologies, biological technologies, many different types, un unrelated types of technology, are like uh, Freeman Dyson's phrase, infinite in all directions. Because as you look at these technologies, there's an infinite capability in many different directions of the technologies being used. So this is the world we live in. This is the world in which the Avatar projects will evolve, a world in which you've got enormous numbers of different technologies which are accelerating very rapidly. We used to talk about the aristocracy in society, 1% of the public being aristocracy, and that word's going to be meaningless. You people who will make big money, the people who will understand the technology, the people who will be the consultants working for Accenture, and so on, the people m managing what we're describing here, but the, <laughs> there won't be a singularity in the way it has been described because all of the big corporations who are using this <coughs> have planned ahead and what they're going to do about that. And so 1% of the public will be a technocracy earning more money than the aristocracy. So a technocracy turning, the aristocracy turning into techno, technocracy of people. By 2030, 80% of all human work, there was a big study of uh, what human jobs can be done better or cheaper or more reliably by machines. And the answer is by the time we get to uh, 2030, at least 80% of all jobs that humans are doing today can be done better by machines. And so what is that going to do to how humans spend their time? Well, it's inevitable that we're going to need a, a, a leisure revolution. 
So as, as we move into the future, we need to think about a renaissance. What do we mean by a future renaissance? People have far more leisure. They want exciting, interesting things to, to do with their leisure. So a leisure revolution. There's a, a, a famous lecture which has been given in a book on the subject called The Bonfire of the Humanities. And a lot of universities are rather alarmed by that, the you know, lack of attention, lack of money going into the humanities. And uh, really, we want the absolute opposite, and that is major attention to the humanities because there are going to be so many people that want to use their, their time to get as uh, good, good a life as possible. Transhumanism means the modification of Homo sapiens, and there are many ways it can be done. A brain-computer interface being exciting for video game manufacturers at the present time. This is a real, real photograph from a video game manufacturer. The brain can rewire itself incredibly fast. We call this plasticity. But it's quite amazing uh, how uh, the brain can rewire, uh, rewire itself to very complex things, very, very fast indeed. And this is part of that. A human blood cell uh, is 7,400 nanometers in diameter. <coughs> and that means it can hold, one, one blood cell could hold uh, three uh, gigabytes of data storage. And we'll have electrodes inside the brain. Anyway, uh, different ways to uh, modify human beings. Uh, humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and we could talk about genetically modifying humans. That would not be a good idea, because inevitably things are going to go wrong, probably interesting things, and uh, if you, you have something going wrong in a child's chromosome, that will be passed on to their children. So if you make a mistake, and we will, those mistakes will be uh, perpetual. So because of that, scientists got together and said no modification of the human DNA because it would lead to dangerous results. But what you can do is you can create a 24th chromosome. <coughs> and in the 24th chromosome, you can put any DNA you want. You can invent any new type of DNA. And the 24th chromosome is absolutely never passed on to the children. It's only your biological chromosomes that are passed on to the children. So you can put any number of genes in the 24th chromosome, so we're likely to have, uh, you probably go down the street, you know, you remember the music stores we used to have selling DVDs, you're probably going to have stores like that selling DNA for the uh, 24th chromosome. And uh, I think this will really take off when it uh, has uh, consumer advertising. So imagine the women's magazines here getting to the point where they're trying to sell the world's sexiest gene packs or having statements about, you know, what, what brain implant should your child have? <coughs> and when we get to the point where we have things to sell from, the avatar projects, the capability to get the public excited and the, the consumer marketplace taking off, that, that's when the thing will change from being something strange in the laboratory to something that humans want to buy. It was a very short time to get from uh, intelligent cell phones, about 10 years, from the first intelligent cell phone to a situation where almost all the kids in the poorest parts of the planet have got access to an intelligent cell phone. And this is going to happen with some forms of uh, human modification. And uh, so in the post-brain map here, <coughs> what will marketing be like? And uh, may, uh, may say things like, uh, does your child lack cognitive enhancements in, in the marketing? Or does humanity lack moral enhancements? And the answer is absolutely yes. There's one book which I very much like. It's a book uh, by Julian Chevalestu called Unfit for the Future. And it's looking at the ethics of today. And we have wonderful ethics associated with the religions. We have guidelines associated with the United Nations uh, resolutions, hu human rights, and so on. But they're not anything like enough for the technology that we have today and the technology that we will have in the future. So a very important subject is uh, designing the moral enhancement that has to go with today's networks and intelligent phones and the result of the avatar projects, whatever they may be. Warfare, changing incredibly. Cyber warfare will be a profoundly intellectual activity. Uh, people, uh, uh, the stars in cyber warfare will probably be more brilliant than top uh, t chess champions. And uh, now, how many of the Joint Chiefs of Staff do you think understand the mind of the hacker? And the answer is none of them. None of them get close to understanding it. 
and uh, cyber war is going to be of immense complexity, it already is today. It's already beginning to become a very big problem today. We keep as quiet about it as possible and the problem becomes uh, politically difficult because much of the cyber attacks are coming from China and so what do we do diplomatically to try and stop that uh, in China? We're almost certainly not going to be able to stop it. So cyber terrorism, cyber warfare, very big, very big subject for the future. Now the tradition of the military is that war is about human courage. And if you look at robots, if you look at the person sitting uh, in a room here, uh, sitting out with a, a predator, to uh, kill a particular individual in Pakistan. There's no human courage at all. It's like a video game. So war is turning from an act of human courage to an intellectual act like complex video games. And we're going to have no end of robots. If you talk to venture capitalists today you know, and ask the question, how are you going to make money in the future? Over and over again they say military robots, intelligent robots, a high level of intelligence built into drones, high level of intelligence built into other robots, enormous numbers of different types of military robots. So total change in warfare. Uh, many of the, many, many of the, much of the controversies about robots relates to the word autonomous. Are, are the robots doing things under their own, with their own decision without a human involved in this? And this particular uh, drone is definitely designed to be totally autonomous. It can stay in the air for a very long time and uh, now, von Clausewitz, the great philosopher of war, said war is the extension of politics. The extension of politics by other means. Well, today you have things in politics where there's no political objective that can justify nuclear war or justify biological war and so on. So we've reached a point in time where there will either be no war between high-tech nations or there will be no civilization. And this, this is the state we're in today. And I think it really is genuinely true that you're not going to have war between high-tech nations. Look at all of the high-tech nations that were involved in war in 1945. There's been no war between any of those nations since then. And this is really good news for my twins. They're going to be living in a world where there won't be wars, like the dreadful wars that we've seen in the, in the past. There will be far more Muslims than Christians, and let's hope that this situation applies to uh, the religions of the world. Fascinating thing about the religions of the world is that so many important things like you can do to your neighbor what you expect your neighbor to do to you. Many statements like that where all the religions say the same thing, and so the, the religions could uh, agree completely in saying that. But although they say completely the same thing, they, they've all got a different God. Uh, and if your God is different from their God, then kill the person with the opposite God. So this is a strange situation with religions. This is the King of Bhutan. He was uh, an absolute monarch, and he decided to give that up and become a uh, political monarch. So it's his goal to measure happiness, to, uh, to have a measure like GMP about the happiness of the country. And uh, so we could uh, ask, you know, what's civilization like in the future? There will be endless new inventions, powerful solutions, new corporations. Our extraordinary technology needs uh, visions of possible destinations. What are the visions of the destinations which can come from the Avatar project? We should not ask what will the future be like because we cannot have a crystal ball. Instead, we should ask how do we shape the future? So with all the technologies I'm talking about, important question, how do you shape the future? With the Avatar projects, how do you shape the future? What are the best consequences that can come from those projects? It may be easy to uh, make uh, brain modification work with animals, uh, with uh, penguins, for example, and so long before humans are immortal, there'll possibly be a situation where penguins are <laughs> immortal. Thank you. <laughs>